imagine you've built a beautiful little log cabin in the woods. It's perfect. A cozy fireplace. A bedroom loft. Even a safe and secure basement with a sturdy ladder going down into it. It's a perfect life, all right. Until a pack of hungry wolves discover that there's fresh meat in the area. You. They decide to invite themselves to dinner. In a snarling, terrifying pack, they send you to the basement. You're safe, for now. Locked down in survival mode. The message could not be any clearer. Do whatever you have to do to stay alive. But it's hard to ponder and difficult to plan and impossible to sort out what you're going to do with all of that growling, slobbering, and clawing going on just above your head. You're frightened out of your wits as your thoughts race in pictures. And the pictures are not good ones. As if you don't have enough troubles, you notice the floor of the basement is wet. Water is seeping in. You now have wolves above you and a basement that is flooding. You will have to do something. Hello, my name is Dr. James Sutton. I'm a psychologist and a trainer specializing in at-risk children and adolescents. Indeed, there are youngsters who attempt to deal with a difficult world and an emotional basement that is flooding. In reality, these youngsters are not in the basement at all, but their behavior says otherwise. I call this behavior desperate behavior. It occurs only in about 1 to 3% of our young people, but it counts for close to 100% of the sort of behavioral problems that don't respond to traditional discipline and interventions. They don't go away. They don't go away. The problem behaviors don't go away because the youngster is in a survival mode, prompted by the images of what he believes will happen if he doesn't act immediately. Whatever the behavior turns out to be, it's driven by desperation, and it's almost always wrong. You can ask the child to explain to you what he or she is thinking, but good luck on that one. They're stuck in the images as the pictures, bad ones, move through their consciousness much too rapidly for them to describe. Dr. Wynne Winger, originator of the concept of image streaming, suggests that images operate approximately 10 million times quicker than word-based language. No wonder we have a hard time communicating with a youngster caught up in desperate behavior. Here's what we know about desperate behavior. Number one, it is brought on by elements that are intrusive and frightening. In other words, it comes on completely uninvited. Flashbacks, we call them flash memories of past trauma, are one example. They can occur spontaneously, completely on their own, or they can be triggered by people, places, things, or circumstances. Especially tough are those flash memories that cause a youngster to actively re-experience past trauma. Their behavior can be seen as an attempt to dislodge the images as they come in order to make them go away. In other words, they're trying to stop the pictures. The death of a loved one can bring on intrusive thought for a child. I had one patient whose grandfather had died. A few weeks later, the boy saw his grandfather walk into his classroom, step up to his desk, and speak to him. The boy began carrying on a conversation with someone who wasn't there. Although his behavior might not have scored highly in terms of desperation, his conversation with a dead man did alarm his classmates. His teacher reported they began moving their desks away from his. Not all intrusive thought is negative. One evening while doing training at the University of Missouri, I walked across the street from the hotel to check out the Columbia Mall. I stepped into a hobby shop. Someone close to me took the cap off a can of model airplane fuel. Instantly, my mind went retro. About 45 years or so retro. The smell of that fuel took me to another place, another time. Dad and I are building a Ringmaster Junior on the kitchen table. I see everything vividly. 
right down to the cut in one of the chairs of the chrome dinette set where my sister had dropped a butcher knife. I see the time on the old kitchen clock, and there's Lady, our dog. Mostly, though, I'm with my father as we worked on that red and white model airplane. Those pictures were so warm and positive that I wanted to take a can of that fuel back to my hotel room. I didn't, but I thought about it. What if, what if the smell of that fuel had connected with some really bad flash memories? What if there were memories of abuse, for instance? At very least, I would have been out of that hobby shop in a hurry. Desperate behavior can be, and often is, associated with a need to escape. Number two, desperate behavior is driven from the deepest parts of self. It's difficult for a child to explain. If the behavior is survival-based, then it's not open to negotiation or discussion. It can't be explained. Asking the why question is a grand exercise in futility. Kindergarten teachers often see the deer-in-the-headlights look on faces of children who have never been around more than two or three other kids in their entire lives. When they have trouble with people that are too close to them, these youngsters might hit them or spit on them or do something that creates more comfortable distance. Number three, desperate behavior seeks to obtain immediate relief. The whole purpose of this behavior is to realize short-term relief. What happens when this youngster hits a peer? The peer usually backs off. A behavior that provides relief in that moment. Or a child might run from the classroom to flee an uncomfortable experience. The goal is always to obtain relief now. Number four. The child's need for relief is many times more powerful than the need to avoid negative consequences. The youngster knows he's in big trouble after an inappropriate behavior. He can even quote the rule and consequence chapter and verse, yet neither the rule nor the consequence prevented the behavior in the first place, nor will they prevent the behavior from happening again. More rules and more consequences don't work with desperate behavior. That should give us a clue. We can try incentives and rewards for appropriate behavior, but we run into the same problem. If the child is seeking relief at a moment of internal distress, incentives and rewards for not acting out won't matter at all. And number five, the last one. Some interventions actually compound the need for relief and yet more desperate behavior. What if some of our approaches for dealing with this child come very close to looking like the bad pictures or a flash memory to the child? If any intervention adds to the intrusive gunk the child is already toting around, and if it magnifies a need for relief, it won't do a thing to solve problems and issues. It can, however, make them worse. This is the first part of a two-part program on the topic of desperate behavior. It comes from a book I'm currently writing. It has the working title of Beyond Behavior. If you'd like more information about this book when it becomes available, email me at the address shown and put Beyond Behavior in the subject line. That's all you need to do. There's no obligation. Thank you, and be watching for Part 2, Fixing Desperate Behavior.